Well, yeah, the modern, and the question is the modern context. Germany is the most, one of the most wealthiest countries right now in Europe. And clearly there, there's some uh, economic warfare going on. Northern Europe versus Southern Europe. And it'd be interesting to see how this all plays out. I mean, this is the, the third world war, except without guns. But isn't it a fact that when the globalization started, the German people and the German government pulled up their socks and went to war? But in the southern part, which is the less uh, poorest people in Europe, they took uh, just to show off for work, they get extra pay. I mean, this is, and the Germans are sort of upset today when they see all this money flowing out of the country into the hands of those people which didn't work. Well, if there's two schools of thought on this. One of the arguments the Southern Europeans will use is they have worked per capita longer hours than the Germans. But what had happened with the, uh, and we, we could discuss this through our blue to page, really not in the context of the course. One of the problems that is uh, created by the European Union is the Northern democracies, Britain, France, and Germany have funded a, a scale of living that the Southern Europeans should never have had by subsidizing them. And who benefited from that? Clearly Germany, France, in England, because they increase consumerism. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned Hitler's ability to, uh, well, throw a spell. In 1949, when I was going to take a I used to check out the 78 RPM records of Hitler's speeches. I didn't understand a word of uh, German, but I can tell you, I've never heard anyone speak in English who could captivate and control and play the audience quite musically. Well, yeah, between, that's one of the things you're going to see with the fascist dictators, Hitler and Mussolini, master orator, master orator. And they have a cadence and they use buzz terms and clearly they mesmerize the audience. Now, are the, are the people that gullible? It's always the question I have. You know, what, what makes the average person start jumping around, cheering, acting like these are the, you know, the, the next best thing? That's always the question I had. And I've always wanted to ask somebody who lived in one of those countries, what was making the people, or how, why were they reacting like this? Uh, because it worked. They had already, by that time, had accomplished stuff nobody else was accomplishing. Exactly. Success, success breeds what? More success. And people believe you after a while when you produce. If you don't produce, it's just rhetoric. Maybe our politicians should take a master of that. <laughs> no rhetoric, just action. I have an excellent friend. I would call him, but I have friends in uh, a business. I'm a college professor. And one, uh, one that I particularly remember was uh, he was Jewish, of course, and uh, he, uh, he had escaped as a child from, from the Holocaust. Thing. And uh, he went back constantly to talk to people and ask the same question because he was too young. And this one German lady said, oh yes, it, it is so terrible about what happened to the Jewish people. But Hitler was such a nice man, you should have heard him. See, and that was it. That was all she could say. She couldn't tell him anything he had said. Clearly, neither of us endorse anti-Semitism any form in the Holocaust. However, there again, you've been down, you've had hyperinflation. Look at those people burning the money in the stove. If you're on a fixed income, you were retired. How did you live? <coughs> you were pretty much out of luck. The German people had basically nothing to lose. Yeah. When this wonderful order came up and started offering, they were well, and that probably begets the issue. Economy counts, doesn't it? You know, if you're down and out and you see hope, 
and stability, people will trade that hope and stability and give up some of their personal freedoms and securities. And that's the scary part of it. So we always must learn from that, you know. Go ahead, there's some questions back here. Question on the board. Sure. 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 An armed, able-bodied man in every household who knows how to use his firearm had a lot to do with nobody ever going in there. Gentlemen, comment about Switzerland and just the uh, literally 100% armed civilian population they have. A lesson for today. Uh, the well, if that's the case, then it keeps our New York cab drivers will keep us safe in New York. <laughs> uh, the, the mandatory conscription would have violated the $100,000 truth limit. What was the justification, or can you address that? Well, the justification is relatively easy. We need it. Well, and right, who's. Right. I'm sorry, good question. He asked about the mandatory conscription, uh, the German miracle, how they had mandatory service in the armed forces, and how that did violate the Treaty of Versailles. It's a good question, and how did they get around that? Who is enforcing this? Any treaty has to be enforced, and again, by this time, really, the French could not, nor would the British enforce it. So the justification is, we need it in the name of national security. Um, I can't comment. Does anyone know? Did the, did France start their mandatory conscription in the 30s before Germany? That's a good question, Ralph. That might be true. Hmm, I'm not familiar with that, but that uh, certainly could slide by these eyes of mine. One thing we know: France was the last European country to be devastated by the Depression. Why? Because they were getting the reparation payments. And remember that the United States, under the Dawes Plan, had underwritten the transfer of funds so Germany could continue to make those payments. Kind of a circular arrangement. We help you, you pay the French. The French will turn in turn buy their stuff from who? Us. Remember, we shared the same role as China now plays in the world in the 1930s. We're not the most powerful country, but we're the economic power that everybody's looking at. Go ahead. Uh, in Germany, a lot of the mandatory conscription was not into the military, but into labor groups that did a lot of, built a lot of the infrastructure. But it, also, the way they ran those labor they were military. They were almost like military, so it was very easy to later conscript them into the army. Yeah, they marched, they drilled, they did the whole thing. Yes. Go ahead. And the German way of the orders of the second world they started working with the youngsters of the Arabian Bowl. Well, yeah. They they'd already had 10 years later. Right, and that's the thing. The Nazis were very effective at beginning a culture of service very young. The Hitler Youth, by age eight, they're joining a, a group that's kind of rivaling our Boy Scouts. That's Except not they're correct. not Boy Scouts. That is not correct, what you said. I was eight years old when Hitler was in power. Uh -huh. I was never asked to join anything. Is that right? That's right. But who joined the Hitler Youth? Because you lived through this. I lived through it. Yes. Who was who was the prime candidate? You must have been older than that. Were you older? I was nine years old when the war ended. Uh -huh. I've never asked, been asked to join. But the thirties, did they did they start? Young yeah, maybe I don't know. Uh huh. That's interesting. Thank you.